All right, guys. Um, hi, welcome back uh, to another Bible study. We're here with us, uh, the Campus Mission Coalition. Um, we're continuing our Bible study um, in the book Faith and Science in a Skeptical Age. Yeah, definitely uh, check this out. Uh, please go online and buy it from Amazon. It's fifteen dollars. It's a really good read. Um, it just talks about a lot of um, contemporary issues with uh, Christians and um, the modern world and science as we uh, currently live in. Um, this week we're continuing on our study. Um, in the last couple weeks we we're talking about, uh, the first week we talked about science versus religion. And then last week we talked about how science and religion does not contradict each other really if you are sticking to the uh, basic principles of uh, both. And this week we're talking about how theology gave birth to modern science. Um, it's a really interesting jump. Um, this is actually chapter 34 of the book, but uh, we went from 1, 2, and to 34, but <laughs> I thought this would be a better um, flow. So uh, please join us in that. Okay, so starting off, we are uh, just a brief introduction. Andrew Dickinson White uh, made a very influential defense of this thesis in a history of the warfare of science with theology and Christendom published in 1896. Scientists are portrayed as enlightened people. Um, this argument was supported by uh, this argument. So basically what the argument is talking about is Dickinson says that science is a study of the world outside of a creator. Um, he, he basically, he doesn't believe that um, science and religion mix. Um, once again, we're still on this, this debate that's been as old as time as we could see, right? Um, and he, he portrays scientists as enlightened and the religious people as unenlightened. Um, this argument was supported by Luther's opposition towards Copernicus' helicentric model of the universe and the Catholics opposing Galileo. Once again, religion versus science. And we, you know, and this, this in general is a very um, common theme that has been, uh, we've been discussing this whole entire time. But, you know, this is, these, these two instances very helps, helps us really see how um, this is a, this is why there's this misunderstanding, right? So but obviously Copernicus at the time with the heliocentric model, uh, meaning that, you know, the earth was at the center of the world, right? And we were revolving around the sun and the Catholics uh, didn't believe in Galileo and they executed him. And so, um, you know, Shale is old as time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty point, much, yeah. right? So, um, so this further perpetuated by science can only observe natural occurrences, but religion works on a supernatural level. So basically, let me change this. Okay, this is a further perpetu this is further perpetuated by science because they can only observe natural occurrences, but religion works on supernatural level. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. clear? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, because of this kind of thought process that came from Dickinson, um, you have the methodolo me methodological naturalism and philosophical naturalism. Uh, methodological naturalism uh, is working as if God does not exist in nature. And philosophical naturalism is nature is all there is. Okay, um, so pretty clear cut. There's a distinct separation between religion and science. science yeah. Okay, uh, on to our next slide. So theology yields to science. Christian theology was actually a major impetus to the rise of modern science. So theology is what leads to science. Um, Stanley Jackie points out in The Savior of Science 
that Christian theology contributed to the idea of a transcendent and rational creator who made humans in his own image. Okay, um, obviously, once again, we're thinking, we as Christians believe that God created us in his image, um, but how does science, you know, how does theology yield to science? Um, and we're stating here that theology was a huge proponent of advancement for science. That's what we're trying to say. But how does this all fit together, this big puzzle? Um, the reality is transcendent is a word that means above and beyond or not contained. Um, imminent is dwelling within. So, and God is rational even in this fallen world. God's rational law is still discoverable in nature. Okay. Uh, these are a bunch of different points that uh, we're going to be talking about here. Um, so, um, basically, transcendent and imminent are actually two characteristics of God, right? And so, God is above and beyond science, and he can't be contained by uh, our understanding with science. But, God also dwells within nature yeah. and all creation. He dwells in it all. And so if we're going to say that science is a study of nature, a uh, study of how things work in the world, how things uh, are uh, come about to be, then we have to understand that God is in it all. Well, that's what Christians believe, right? That's what most Christians believe. And a lot of these uh, modern science uh, scientists, some of them are now claiming that, you know, we live in a world outside of God. And um, as our um, Andrew Dickinson on the previous page is saying that if, there, if scientists are the enlightened people, then Christians or religious people are the unenlightened. And so if we're looking at this here, we're st I'm still getting, I'm still wrapping this back into um, this uh, argument because why? I'm not, I, I'm not defending any of this right now, right? Like you know, literally, I'm, what I'm saying is I'm kind of just going back in the circle and I'm just twisting around over and over again. And um, so let's think of this all over again. Let's kind of just take another approach at this. So modern scientists states that Christians, oh, religious people, and science stands apart, right? Yeah. But Christians believe that God is in everything. He is yeah. the creator of everything, and he is a part of everything. And if you're going to say that science is a study of creation or the natural world, then we could correctly say that scientists are studying God's creation, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, and we, if, if we maintain that God is a rational God, then even in this fallen world, God's rational law is still discoverable in nature. And what do I mean by that? It means that things happen according to God's design, right? There is a God. He created this world. And there is a design. Um, go ahead and see uh, modern science does not appear until the 16th century. Is that interesting? Yes. You know, but Christianity has been around for over 2,000 years. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a huge disparity between modern science and Christianity. Um, and why is this the case? This is the this is the reason is because medieval scholasticism has major generation for classical texts, including scriptures and the Greco-Roman works. 
right? So meaning that the study of how the world functions prior to the 16th century was deferred to scripture and the Greco-Roman Greco right? So like basically, Aristotle was viewed as a philosopher. Yeah, yeah, he put more and more many of the modern science understanding the world. So he theorizes how the world will work based on writings, philosophy, literature, versus an actual study of the world. Yeah. Scholasticism and mentality. Why do we experiment when we already know the results? Right? So basically, if you're thinking about it, we believe in the early century, everyone believed that the world happened and believed in the moon and the earth and then was working in a way that was largely described by the scriptures and or the Roman and, and, and re re understanding the world. And at that, that, that time, the, the Roman re re understanding the world was all of the Judaism and, and um, what's the other word? One by five. Wait, 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 wait. But um, it's basically really meaning that the re 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 Romans explain that these things happen, that there's an individual who has that these things happen. Right? right? The sun will go to die. die. Why? Why? Because of all of the Holy Land and the Holy Chariot, right? right? There's a lot of people who are because of Zeus or Jerusalem going right on the whole town. Hard work has happened because the Lord of God is the last. So, so why, why do you need to understand how things work, work if it just is already attributed the basic understanding of the Arctic function to a supernatural being? And so, so that was one of the reasons why there was such a large disparity between people who find the learn why things happen versus the normal one. Society was like, why, why, why would you try to talk about the brain? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 the, the church used allegory to interpret the natural world, meaning birds has an allegorical meaning. Jesus is the bird of the king of the temple. So remember, when Jesus went to the temple and there was all these vendors, he was selling goats and rams, doves, or for a hotel offerings. And then Jesus knocked the birds down on the cages of the doves down, and then the doves flew out. People that contemporary time were believing that, oh, that had an allegorical out of out of meaning. Jesus was freeing us from our cages. He was freeing us from the founded temple. And so, was that kind of mentality of thinking how everything had meaning to it, you know, the understanding of the scripture was, was also viewed in a different manner, in a different way. And it did not help the growth of. Um, science. Yeah. You know, science was inhibited. Uh -huh. But then again, see, theology, Reformation in theology, was the reason how science advancement was allowed to happen, right? So, so the reformers realized that allegorical interpretation of the Bible was speculative, meaning that that's just a point of view, someone's speculation, someone's thought. It's not the true nature of it. And so the reformers like Martin Luther kind of took more of a literal approach to what the scriptures were writing about. And then with that, he, uh, Martin Luther encouraged so many people to uh, study why things happen. So the forefront of modern science included Lutherans such as Tycho Brahe, Johann Kepler, and Joachim Rectus. So a literal approach focuses science on an accurate description and measurement. Therefore, a Christian scientist can do the methodological naturalism studies. Meaning that 
as a Christian, it was okay for you to study how the world functioned, not, uh, but not negating that the, uh, this was allowed by God, but God created this functionality. Yeah, it's like appreciating the art. You know, yeah. The craftsmanship. Exactly. So it is their vocation to observe and study creation and how it all comes together. However, they can still maintain that God's creative intervention led to the creation of nature. Right? And this was, this was the beginning of actual scientific study. You know, um, these guys went out and started studying why things happen, like in God's creation. So the book of nature, even after the fall, humans can make sense of God's creation. So you guys kind of get what that means? Yeah. yeah. So that's why nowadays there are people that can still do science, mm -hmm. even though they're not religious yeah. or they don't believe in God, right? So um, Luke, can you read this uh, Psalm 19 for us? Yeah. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world, and the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. So, in other words, Psalm 19 is telling us that nature has speech. Mm -hmm. Nature has something to say. The, the reality that we live in, things happen for a reason, and God has given voice to his creation. And that voice is, we're able to identify it and learn from it and we can hear it through our uh, observation of how God creation comes to be or how God's creation is interacting with each other throughout the world. So scientists are encouraged to look for mathematical regularities governed by nature's operation, right? Pretty clear yeah. what we're saying. That's yeah. why nature has a voice and scientists are encouraged to do it. If nature is a book, one must suppose there is an author. Yeah. Right? So the reality is a lot of people think that because, you know, it's going back to this argument of science versus religion and people, and since God allows people to be able to understand and observe how the world works and interacts apart from faith, it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that negating God is tangible, right? Because what is the biggest question? But without faith in God, observation of nature's process is incoherent and meaningless text. And I put in parentheses why, because what what's the real issue there? The issue there is you can learn, observe how things happen, and everything like that, but you can never really answer why, right? Yeah. So why is two hydrogen and an oxygen atom combined together and make water? Mm -hmm. We know that it does that, yeah, but we don't know why. Why are those the two atoms that make water? Mm -hmm. You know, why couldn't it be three hydrogens or one hydrogen and two uh, oxygens? Yeah, there's a scientific explanation because of the atoms and how they interact with each other, sure, but it doesn't give a reason why that specifically produces water. Why one plus one equals two? We know, we know that it is because that's the law of nature, right? Mm -hmm. 
That's the rational understanding of God. We, you know, God gave us rationale, and but it abides to, uh, to some kind of law, and it's His law, His creation. We can study it all in one. We can say that this happens because of this happens, apart from saying that God is what made this component come together, this component, to whatever. We're just talking about the surface level. We're saying this component plus this component equals that. But God sitting there, or God's hand is in it. Because, you know, one of the things is, Water is really hard to create, right? Yeah. It's like, it's nearly impossible in a sense. Um, like, you could take a hydrogen atom, an uh, oxygen atom, combine them together, and there is condensation and stuff like that. But, like, to make it gush out in, like, bountiful amounts of water, it doesn't happen easily. Yeah. But yet, nature itself does it magically. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we, you know, there's always that question of, where does that source of water come from? Yeah. And why is that source of water happening? Yeah. What got the ball rolling in the water cycle? Yeah. You know? Right? Yeah. So it's it, it's it's super incredible how that is, you know, what it's coming about, you know? And so um, look at the next one. The fall caused our rational faculties to no longer understand God's creation without regeneration of faith. Um, you know, it's basically what we're saying is, as Christians, because of our um, faith, that basically brings us back to fullness, we're able to understand God's purpose for creation. But apart from it, we really can't understand why God created the world, why things exist, why things are the way they are. We attribute that because of our faith, we we know it deep in our hearts that that is the case, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that's one of the biggest things that nowadays you have so many people that's in the opposition to uh, to religion and they're, they're holding science to be the pinnacle of all answers is because they're living in a world without faith. Um, you know, me and David here, we know someone who grew up in the church and uh, one day just outright said, I don't believe in God. I believe in the Big Bang. And you're like, okay, cool. I can accept the Big Bang too. Mm -hmm. I can accept it as, you know, um, don't hold me to this interpretation, but, you know, it's, I can accept the Big Bang as God doing this. Yeah. And the cosmos came about, right? Yeah. And, okay, and we, as we discussed last week, the Big Bang is a theory of how the world came into existence, but the theory can only tell you how. It doesn't tell you why. And we're getting back to the age-old question of why God created the world, and you honestly can't accept an answer for that without faith, right? Faith is what allows you to believe that God has created the world for his purposes, his own reasonings. Mm -hmm. And we believe it because we do. Yeah. You know, like there's, there's no point of where we say, I'm in the process of believing, right? As Lutherans know, we, we don't, slowly come to believe something, it is we believe or we don't. If you're in the process of believing, you still haven't believed yet. You're still like, there's still doubt in you. you. You still don't think that that's possible. And so when we're thinking about why, it can only come from God. And at no time does this inhibit the growth of science and the development of science. Because honestly, like we understood in the last slide, most scientists were theologians. Um, I believe Kepler was a theologian, was becoming a pastor, um, and then decided that, 
being a pastor was not was not his calling. Being a scientist because of his faith was his calling. Mm -hmm. He wanted to sit there and discover God's beautiful creation. Yeah. And he wanted to learn about it. He wanted to form his thoughts and understanding about it. And that's why he devoted himself to the study of God's creation, God's, the nature, the book of nature. And uh, so if we look at Romans 1, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Paul is basically saying that God created this world, but he did not show us how he created this world mm -hmm. for the purpose of God is the creator. He is beyond our understanding. Yep. And there's no excuse to deny him. Because the only way to deny him is to prove that he doesn't exist. And there's no way you can prove our existence didn't come from him. Right. So, I don't know. What do you guys think? How do you guys feel? Um, this is just uh, basically a carry-on from our study from last week. Yeah. But, uh, I, you know, I think it's just, it, it's... They go well together. They go well together. It yeah. really does. You know, um... Uh, we're going from chapter 2 to chapter 34, uh, but the, the science, you know, the majority of the people that try to disprove religion are actual theologians, mm -hmm. right? They are people who study the word yeah. and then go out into the world and try to disprove the word with their studies. Just like any scientist testing a theory. Exactly. Right? And how did this evolve? It kept evolving because now people are like, at first, in the beginning, just like we were saying in like early medieval days, scripture and the classic writings was how our understanding of the world was based on. Mm -hmm. Right. So, in order to understand why something happened, we turn to the philosophers and scriptures of the uh, first, second, third century, mm -hmm. and then from there, you use that to prove why things occur in the world. And then slowly, we do we evolve and we stop using those the scriptures and the classical uh, uh, understanding of the world because now we we use the term philosophy. They're philosophies. They're not science. Yeah. And then we use observed understanding to explain unexplainable. Right, yeah. So it, it's it's an evolution but based on theology. Right. right. But then again, also you have to understand that this evolution comes from God because God gives us the ability to un observe and understand and appreciate his creation, which is including us, yeah. but also the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. And so to, to say that science, that to say that believing in God is opposition of science, once again, is a folly. You know, it's a fallacy. It's saying that, you know, I don't understand why people feel that way. And, you know, we're, we're basing it off, you know, earlier we talked about how it was one of the notions was that Luther denied heliocentric understanding of the universe. And obviously Galileo was burned at the stake, right? And from there, it just kept evolving, 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 creating a chasm between religion and science. But if you take time, just like so many has done throughout history, to study the scriptures and then compare it or juxtapose it to science, is there really an opposition? 
No, because it's talking about two completely different things. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just how the way I see it. You know? Yeah, I mean, but then again, you could you could study the world and not reference God at all, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then you could study the world with in reference to God, but at the end of the day, that same observation is the same. Because why? We're just talking about how the world moves about. Yeah. Why it functions. Why it, why it functions, why it is, why it does. Mm -hmm. And one one answer might say why is because of God, and the other one just can't tell you why. Mm -hmm. It just tells you it just is. Yeah. And honestly, that is faith in the natural understanding of how the world works. Mm -hmm. You have to believe that that's just how the world works, and you just believe it as that. Once again, it is a belief and a faith, right? Which is semi-unfounded because you're putting faith in something that you can't really prove, just like Christians are putting faith in something that they cannot visually prove, mm -hmm. but has proved in so many other different ways. Right, yeah. Like, we can't visually show you God, but we can visually show how God has played his hand in our lives. Mm -hmm. So, once again, science versus religion. Yeah. Let's, how do we start a wave of dropping the verses? That should be just science and religion, right? Mm -hmm. That is something to think about. So, um, let's see. Do we have any questions or thoughts uh, out there? So, yeah, I mean, we're... We've talked about this quite a bit the last week. Um, mm -hmm. We're just hashing it out once again. But this time, it's a little different in the sense that we are showing that scientists evolved from theologians. Yeah. yeah. And if the earliest scientists were theologians, my question is, where's, where did the falling out happen? Where's the missing link? Yeah. You know? Like, why did we get to the point where theologians we're no longer scientists. Yeah. Um, you know, and what is the definition of a modern scientist? Sure. And, you know, and it's, and historically, we've already talked about it in uh, the first slide, I believe. Um, yeah, methodological naturalism and philosophical naturalism. Um, scientists today is saying God does not exist in the in nature and nature is all there is mm -hmm. and a Christian scientist could do the same yeah you know when a Christian scientist is in the lab and they're studying and doing research on something they're not saying that they're not saying that I'm praying to God that this is how this is going to happen Right. They're, based, they're still doing what's necessary above doing a full scientific method yeah. experiment. Right, they're still rooting that same reason that God helped us. So yes, exactly. Yeah. And that, re that human reason is in all of us. That rational law is in all of us. And it's just, we all use it, but some of us could accept a why answer as God, yeah. and some of us just can't accept that why answer mm -hmm. as God. Yeah. Anything to add, Pastor Bart? Well, um, I don't, I mean, we kind of touched all, yeah. Yeah, I think we, we've beaten this horse dead a little bit already. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
yeah, I think we're going to leave it there today. Um, I know it's a little bit shorter than usual, but uh, let's close with a prayer and uh, see how that goes. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this wonderful time for us to uh, come and uh, discuss once again um, our existence in the world um, with your blessing, um, our understanding that you are the intervener of how things come to be and why things are. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to understand that you are the inspiration for scientific growth and development. You are the reason we are able to amount to these answers. Please um, bless us and bless those who hear this study that we may um, truly ingrain this into our hearts and be able to share with others how we are not in opposition of the progress of science, but as a proponent for science growth. I pray in your holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Um, pretty much it for us today. So um, please definitely uh, reach out to us, email, or join us next week uh, and uh, ask some questions. We'd love to. Not next week. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Not next week. We are taking a break next week. Um, I will be out of town uh, on a pastor's training event. Um, so we're going to take a week off. Um, you know, a lot of the UCs are having midterms anyways, so I'm pretty sure you guys can use some of that time for study. So um, please join us in two weeks. Uh, follow, up, uh, follow up on the cmc-psd.com website and um, look up under Bible studies for our updated links and uh, PDFs of the chapters that we're going to be studying on. And uh, please join us again next week. All right. All right. Well, um, Thank you and God bless.